Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to a one-hour partnership of Eldridge and & Company and City Talk. Joining me is the host of City Talk, Professor Doug Muzio, and the noted civil rights and civil liberties attorney, Norman Siegel. So the question today is what's happening to the fundamental rights that we so often take for granted, such as the right to go where we wish and read what we want and mingle with whomever we choose and say absolutely, almost absolutely anything we want to say. Um, let's start by saying, how can we not be let into a park that we own? Well, there's always been a tension with regard to people's rights, especially people who are protesters. Uh, the history of America, the history of New York City shows the tension between the right to protest, the right to march, the right to rally, all under the First Amendment, and the government's wanting to either prohibit or regulate it, and sometimes regulate it in an unreasonable way. Post 9-11, 9-11 uh, horrific day, uh, uh, changed a lot. And what's happened post 9-11 is the government has been using, in my opinion, uh, the war on terrorism as another argument, uh, sometimes directly, very often indirectly, very often it's uh, subliminal, uh, but it's always there. And the answer to your question, Ronnie, is that uh, today, 2004, uh, our freedoms have in fact been diminished. And the scary question is, if you project five, ten years, our children, our grandchildren, I believe that they're going to grow up in a city, in a country, which has substantially less freedoms and less rights than we had. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Monday, the federal judge ruled against uh, protesters were asking for a permit to rally in Central Park and today the a, a similar case is before state supreme could you talk about the judge's ruling the federal judge's ruling uh, standing by the city's decision to prohibit the uh, the protest and your expectations for what well, might happen and today briefly why what's the difference between a federal court and a state court in the jurisdiction good well tactically it was a very clever and smart move for the protesters to bifurcate the issue. Uh, federal court uh, deals with First Amendment issues. Uh, the state court has a comparable First Amendment uh, in the state constitution, uh, the right of freedom of speech. And so once one of the groups went into the federal court, uh, the other group, United Peace and, Ju United Peace and Justice, Justice uh, <laughs> said it so many times and I lose it at this point, but anyway, uh, they, I think cleverly, Just went into the state court because as mm -hmm. we grew up in the streets of Brooklyn, you get two cracks at the right. apple. And all it takes is so one really judge. So there really isn't any difference in... in the arguments are going to be similar, go. except when you say, and therefore, under the First Amendment of the federal constitution, the federal court, and in the state court, you'll say, and consequently, under the state constitution okay. provision, okay. blah, 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 boom. Uh, we have our federalist system in the sense of federalism, and so you have both the federal courts mm -hmm. and the state courts. Now, one interesting point when it gets to First Amendment freedoms, right to free speech, the right to protest, the state court has on some occasions said that the federal constitution is a minimum and that the state constitution can and does in certain instances give greater freedom and greater rights. So it's conceivable that the state court could go further than the federal court, but usually the federal court, the much more prestigious of the two bodies, uh, usually has a major say on these issues. And in the state court, the state judge, of course, will have that atmospherically in her court. Mm -hmm. Now, what the protesters did is they went in and asked for an injunction in joining the city from denying their right to be in Central Park. The judge yesterday, Judge Pauley, wrote a decision federal that judge. said, federal judge, who said, one, uh, in essence, you waited too long. Uh, you knew at the end of June that the permit was going to be denied. Why did you wait to the mm -hmm. middle of August to come in? That doctrine is called laches, L-A-C-H-E-S. Uh, it basically says the court's not going to reward someone who comes into the court with dirty hands. And the dirty hands in this situation is you waited too long. The city argued that they needed to plan properly, and there's some legitimacy to that. And therefore, today in the state court, uh, those thing. folks are going to have the same issue. On the merits, the judge looked at the uh, rules that the Parks Department has with regard to permits. The argument in federal court, which was unsuccessful, the argument in the state court will be that the rules discriminate 
based on the content of the activity. So the rock concert. So the event, rock yeah. concert, the cultural yeah. events, uh, the Pope. Uh, you give them permits there, but you don't give an ideological rally, uh, anti-war, anti-Bush. Uh, what the judge in the federal court did, step-by-step, uh, step, analyzed that and concluded that the Parks Department rules and regulation are not content-based, that they are, in fact, neutral. And that's a major premise that undercuts the right to have the park. Now, after saying that, uh, in the federal decision, and I'm sure they'll be in the state hearing today, uh, there was a sense that, why can't we reach a compromise? Why can't we work something out? Uh, to the credit of the federal judge, he recognized the importance, the significance of the First Amendment right to protest. Uh, he actually went as far as saying explicitly that, from his understanding, this is the first time that the protest group and the city are talking to each other. For example, big deal over the fact that there was no rain date. Uh, you always start rain dates for baseball yeah, games. Yeah, but in all fairness, uh -huh. yesterday's case is a group that has not been as well prepared or well organized as, as United for Peace and Justice. Right, but on the other so. hand, the, the group today, United Peace and Justice, has an additional problem that they'll have to overcome in the sense that they had agreed to go right. one place and then they changed their mind, right. I think for good reasons, but it would seem to me that in looking at the latches argument, uh, the state court judge, if she chooses to go there, has some um, solid ground. But the problem is, I mean, it's a political problem, and I was thinking about that at the beginning when you asked this question about the park and the different court decisions, and you, you with your dire prediction of what the future is going to be, is that at the bottom of all of this, there is a degree, a large degree of politics, and, and really... Oh. Big surprise! surprise. So, and that's good. Surprise. But then you carry the politics down to the smaller realm, which is United for Peace and Justice. They agreed because they had negotiated with the police for a long time. They wanted to be reasonable. They were forced because there was no alternative. Time after time, the police department came back. But then they went back to their constituency, and theirs, as opposed to the group yesterday, is a, is a coalition of many groups. And their constituents said, no, no. we're not going to do that. Right. So in the interest of order, United for Peace and Justice went back to the police department and said, we, we can't do this. I think so that, that's a political thing also. I mean, it, it's just that everything in life is political, well, I'll right? Get, I'll get to the, <laughs> yes, and I'll get to the political thing in a second. But uh, for United Peace and Justice, I think that even in view of what we've just talked about, there's still enough time. Uh, to allow them to have the park. Yeah. I remember I represented a group of uh, gay and lesbians who wanted to march up Fifth Avenue on the 25th anniversary of Stonewall. Uh, the uh, established group, interesting enough, led by Leslie Kagan, had <laughs> come up First Avenue in 59th. They got the permit. The rebels uh, in that uh, community wanted to come up Fifth Avenue, and they specifically wanted to go past St. Patrick's mm -hmm. Cathedral. And we went to court. We were in court for two or three days, including to that Friday night, like 7 o'clock before Judge Patterson, when the march and rally was scheduled for that Sunday. The judge there, very good judge, said, I'm not going to give you the injunction, but I direct the city lawyers and the lawyers for the protesters to continue tonight and tomorrow to try to work it out. The judge yesterday suggested he didn't direct anyone. Mm -hmm. And 3 o'clock that afternoon on Saturday, I got a call from uh, Michael Julian from the police department, mm -hmm. who basically said, uh, let's get together, we're going to let you people come up Fifth Avenue. So uh, that happened in 95. If there's a political com commitment to allow people to march and to have the rally, exactly. they can they make can it, it happen. Now on the political point, when you take what happened on what I consider to be one of the dark days in New York City history, February 15th, 2003, Michael Bloomberg is the mayor, the last march. and Ray Kelly mm -hmm. is the police commissioner, did something I thought would never happen in the city of New York. They denied the right of hundreds of thousands of people to march in the streets of the city of New York, and they got away with it. Uh, if they get away with this... They didn't get away with it because they took a lot of heat. They did it. Well, people could not march. Mm -hmm. Right. They allowed a rally. Right. They could not march. because there was no march... But I think the in the long run, they lost, and they should remember that well now. Well, mm -hmm. they're not remembering it I well, know. and they're That's building on it because now we have the possibility of one... Uh, we uh, diminish the right to march under the First Amendment, and now potentially we're going to diminish the right to hold a peaceful rally under Bloomberg and Kelly. I think that in the mayor's race, in the citywide elections in 2005, this must become 
a major issue. Uh, the issue is civil rights and the right to protest because Mayor Bloomberg and his administration on his watch has trampled on people's First Amendment rights. I want to go back to an earlier, your analysis of the judge's decision yesterday. I mean, for a non-lawyer, it looked like lawn care trumped free speech, that the rules of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation trump the First Amendment. Now, am I just a blind you know, liberal 60s type that I'm reading this through selective But you know lenses. what? Even more than that, it brings up again the question of the role of the conservancy, the Central Park Conservancy. Well, absolutely. Which is the private, off, oh. un unaccountable to anybody except by a contract to the Parks Department for the maintenance, the care and maintenance and development of that park. Well, well I live across the street from the park, love the park, go into the park lots of times, especially my summer vacations are in the park. Uh, oh, you get away a little bit. Come a on. little, a little. <laughs> Uh, but uh, my instinct on this, I don't have any proof for this, is that Bloomberg perhaps is uh, playing to that constituency. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the park, no doubt about it, has become a beautiful park, but I used to think it was a beautiful park even before they put all this money into it. What's also happened in the park is it's not as open and free as right. it used to be, and there's areas now that are off limits for this, for that, and I think that uh, when this issue uh, it's not front and center anymore. There has to be a serious discussion about the uh, park and who really runs that park and whether or not the Parks Department is really a puppet of the Central there Park Conservancy. There was an attempt when I was in the City Council, in all fairness, there was an attempt to question that by on the part of some of us and we were very opposed to that contract and that arrangement but we didn't get very far. It was under the Giuliani administration and that was... Uh, well, these questions decided. must be asked because the it's park... It's a very fundamental, important question. It's a huge... Uh, landmark, it's a symbol, uh, and if we don't succeed in getting the park for a peaceful rally, uh, really there's no major place in Manhattan that can hold mm. six figures, but meaning 100,000 or okay. more. But th this is a larger issue of the diminution of public space, not only that park, but other parks and other public venues are be increasingly closed off to the public, whether it's the City Hall Park, which again, it was an aesthetic yeah. success, but an exercise in control and order. So there's, there's is, no doubt about that for people to understand in the old days, the old days 15 years ago or 10 years ago even, uh, major demonstrations against the uh, city administration, usually the mayor, the executive branch, sometimes the legislative branch, sometimes Ronnie's colleagues right. at the city council, never Ronnie, of course. Uh, but you would have the rally at the southern part of City Hall mm -hmm. Park. And I always loved it because when I was on a podium, you were looking straight at City Hall when you can point your finger well, I remember at there. That big right. that now you can't do that. Right. Uh, the way they set it up, is that you can't get thousands of people. So now you're outside the park, sometimes on Broadway, and it doesn't have the same context. Right. No, it's not at all. You remember Housing Works, for heaven's sakes, we had that big rally right on the plaza. Right. I remember during uh, the Vietnam War when we had it right on the steps. I mean, that is what was so wonderful about that marketplace of ideas and the interaction and why city government was so exciting because you had people coming right up on the steps. But even on that, we had to go but, three times yeah, to federal I court. That. And Judge Harold Bear, to his credit, on three different occasions, rejected the Giuliani administration's arguments and said that the First Amendment is alive and well on the steps of City Hall. And whenever I see the press conferences today, I feel good about that. Mm -hmm. The question becomes is whether or not that opportunity to challenge government and succeed when the government, in my opinion, is making arguments that are trampling on First Amendment rights, whether the climate today allows for those kinds of wins. And it appears that the answer to that is unfortunately no. Okay, let's, I, I, I want to focus a little bit on Michael Bloomberg and his orientation toward disorder. Last week he yeah. had an unfortunate no, remark right. that speech was a privilege and that if you disabuse <laughs> your privileges, they can be taken away. Right. Excuse me, Daddy, Daddy Bloomberg. Daddy, right. what's, is, does this reflect just sloppiness or is this a fundamental that reflects, misconception of politics? It reflects a politics? business person becoming a politician. I mean, they're not they don't understand the essence of government. Government is more than just coming in and setting up systems and agencies that can yeah. make it work. But what's missing, I mean, it's just what's incredible. missing, I think, with Michael Bloomberg and also in a lot of the arenas is the lack of dynamic leadership. 
Uh, politicians should not just be politicians. We need leaders. Well, that's we need people to build bridges. Right. We need people to bring people together. And if you come to the table from a narrow perspective, based on your life experiences, uh, we lose something. And there's a huge vacuum of leadership in the city. And to some extent, I'm troubled and worried about what's going to happen during the Republican National Convention, because the wins that the city got yesterday and that they might get today, in my opinion, can come back to haunt them next week. What I mean by that uh -huh. is, in 92, when I was the lawyer for protesters, granted, it was Democratic Convention, granted, it was not a sitting president, grant, we weren't at war. But what happened is, prior to and during the four or five days during the convention, there was a spirit of cooperation and trust, so that when the things that we didn't plan for happened, splinter groups, ad hoc actions, mm -hmm. there was a climate of trust and cooperation, and that got us through relatively well in 92. I don't think that exists today. So there will be history shows. There will be people that we don't even know where they came from mm -hmm. that will be here out on the streets. And when they do what they're going to do, uh, whether it's peaceful or traditional civil disobedience or even non-traditional mm -hmm. civil disobedience, if you don't have that backdrop of cooperation and trust, you don't get through it in the way you want to get through it. Okay, now, not getting through it means you've got... I'm sorry. <laughs> it's my show. Excuse me. <laughs> No, it's both of us. Oh, I'm shows. sorry. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, go mediator. ahead. Go ahead. The, the voice of reason. That's a new role for yes. me. Yes. <laughs> well, no, always the voice of reason. Thank you. You've got this conflict here between a mayor and the protesters. In terms of the impact of what you just described, you've got friction. It leads to, without this trust. It escalates. You've got arrests. What what happens to the the event itself? Does it become, as the New York Times suggested on its front page on Sunday, that this would be an excuse for Republicans to to tie this to the Democrats? Is there? I don't want absolutely. to be too conspiratorial yeah, about yeah, this, absolutely. but in fact, if it's it almost happens, like they're provoking, right? There's, there's well, I mean, they, we, that's the next step. There's plenty of discussions that I've been part of where people are not sure they want to go and demonstrate because they think that the capacity for a repeat of 68 in Chicago, where many historians say that Humphrey lost the election and Nixon won because of the street demonstrations. So I've been privy to many conversations where people have tactical mm -hmm. questions. People of my generation uh, from the 60s are not sure what to do. Uh, on the other hand, I think that people should not hold back. I think that they should recognize that it's a fundamental right. It can't be undermined. And hopefully people will be peaceful. And even if there is action by the police that is not called for, that, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. However, the history again shows that there will be some who, in fact, are not coming with that intent mm -hmm. and are not going to play by those rules. And that's the key issue of is there a climate that allows for flexibility to deal with that mm -hmm. without creating major problems or major disruptions. Right. And finally, the large, large percentage of people who are peaceful and nonviolent who are coming, they will watch how the government, the police, interact with the small group, the mm -hmm. splinter groups. And if they treat them fairly and in a way that's consistent with the history of New York City, then I think we're okay. But if, in fact, there's excessive behavior, then you have the potential for other people deciding to speak out and begin to act out mm -hmm. as well. And the Bloomberg administration, I don't think, gets it. I think they're clueless about this because I don't think if you've been part of marches and demonstrations. Uh, it also says something if you're 60 years old and you haven't been on major marches and protests. It says something about your character. It also says something about your commitment to change and social justice. So when you don't have people who are running the town, who've been marching, who've been in protest, uh, it's understandable that they see it one-dimensional. I am, um, first of all, lots of these people, peaceful people, are going to go into the park. And the Bloomberg administration has to understand that. And they have a right to go into the park, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. They just as long as they don't have the sound equipment. Isn't that what the whole thing is all about? Is that you need sound equipment for a big rally? You can go into the park and uh you can walk through the park. Uh I've suggested to people that if in fact we don't get the permits, that on every night of the Republican convention, whatever you've done that day, 
wind up in the park. the park at 1030 at night and bring yeah. a candle. Yeah. And at 1101, when the local news is reporting about what happened, there will be visuals of hopefully thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the park with a candle in opposition not just to the Bush agenda, but also in opposition to, to the, the fact city. that we didn't get the park right. and Very in support good. of freedom of speech. And for people that are listening, you have a right to go into the park until 1 o'clock in the morning. You've got to get out, otherwise there's a curfew. Mm -hmm. And second, you have a right to bring a candle and stand anywhere you want in the park and light the candle. And wear whatever buttons and shirts. And, and, whatever. Right. and talk to so, your neighbor. And, and I'm, I'm confident, William, anybody. after 15 years of being the head of the Civil Liberties Union, being a lawyer for many of the groups and loving this kind of activity, <laughs> is that New Yorkers and protest people will be creative. Uh, they will be lawful. They will be peaceful and they will be very creative in getting across these messages. And the city should not be threatened by this and should actually applaud those efforts. Giving these buttons, that was so condescending it's and demeaning outrageous. to what the First Amendment is all about. Right. And I understand why people are not being critical because to the credit of the protesters, they don't want to create more tension. But when Bloomberg, not only when he says that First Amendment rights are a privilege, but when they play with the First Amendment right, you know, people have died for the First Amendment right. And when they put out this little button, I particularly are very offended because it trivializes what the right to protest is all about. But it's also exceedingly insidious, that worry about what happens if there's a little bit of uh, deviant behavior, or whatever you want to call it, at protesting. And I, it's a self-censorship that after a while becomes um, an accomplice to people who are already interested in suppressing your rights. Well, that's I mean, what intimidation does. It's a does. very dangerous kind of, of concept. I met a, a very active, um, very smart Democratic person yesterday, and he told me he's very worried about the demonstrators, and it sent a chill through me because I think that that's, um, that is something that we just can't allow to limit our actions. Well, I agree with that. And then you also had last week where we learned that the FBI was right. interrogating protesters. And absent probable cause or reasonable suspicion that a person is engaged in or will engage in criminal activity, it is antithetical to America's commitment to the right to protest, to target and question protesters. I also want to add uh, that I have information to believe that our police department uh, does the same thing. I know at least in one instance, someone that I know, uh, we're in his business. Uh, he got a phone call and the police intelligence person said that uh, they got a complaint that he was making anti-government statements, whatever the heck that is. And I, when the call came to my home, I said to the person I knew, I don't believe it. Give me the phone number, I'll call. That doesn't happen in New York. You know, it's the idea of Big Brother knocking on your door and asking you political questions. So I call, and sure enough, the person confirmed that it was the NYPD intelligence unit and confirmed that this was the officer who uh, the person said had called him. So I've written to the mayor and the police commissioner. It was two months ago. I haven't gotten a response yet from either one of them. And in the letter, I said to them, I want to know why this happened, and more important, how widespread is this? And I have a feeling, again, no evidence, that they're not responding because it potentially is widespread. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of, you know, Orwellian uh, concepts of the knock on the door, the phone call in the middle of the night, that is in totalitarian systems, not in an open democratic society. So when we look at where we are and where potentially we're going, uh, it's troubling. And the premise is uh, terrorism. And I want to come back. The, the, war on terrorism, there is a war. It is a legitimate government interest to protect us and to try to come up with programs to narrowly tailor what the legitimate government interest is, not widespread shotgun approaches that sweep in innocent people. So if you're concerned about demonstrators because hypothetically you're afraid that someone's going to, like in Israel, uh, attach a bomb to their body and then just explode and self demulate themselves, uh, then that's one issue that you have to approach. But the idea of thinking that the demonstrators are all coming to the demonstration, or many of them are coming to the demonstration uh, in order to be violent and to disrupt, 
there's just no evidence from my uh, perspective. So set it up narrowly and tailor it in such a way that you approach that legitimate government interest and do not engage in broad sweeps of bringing in other people. Can we just take a break now okay. and come back? And when we come back, we'll uh, discuss the Patriot Act and yeah, some of the other Orwellian. legislation. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in a few seconds. All the work that I have to do, I don't have any time to actually find What is this? Oh, and it's like a foot away from the trash can. So yeah, hang on a second. You won't believe this. Please tell me somebody didn't just drop that there. Yeah. My husband would freak if he saw this. Yeah, well, it's been there a while. Really? Yeah. Oh. Man, I'm like this close to throwing it away myself. I don't blame you. I mean, who would put it to the trash can? Don't just take a stand. Act. The most powerful way is to simply register and vote. Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge, and we're back again with our combined Eldridge and Company and City Talk, and my colleague Doug Musio and our friend Norman Siegel. Civil rights, civil liberties. Attorney, what's the difference between civil rights and civil liberties? That's what. Um, well, there's overlap. Doug has wanted to know. There's overlap, but I think in the last 40 or 50 years, the way I define it, civil rights is rights concerning groups. It came about in the civil rights movement uh, for African Americans, Latinos, women, gays, and lesbians. Uh, civil liberties is things that we were talking about before: First Amendment right to protest, right to speak, to write what you want to write. Fourth Amendment rights to be protected against unreasonable searches and seizures by the police. So there's a lot of overlap, but I think that the common sense when you hear civil rights, you're talking about race, gender, sexual orientation. When Good. you're talking about civil liberties, you're talking about more abstract principles under the Bill of Rights. Very clear, right, Professor? Uh, clear enough, yes. I want to uh, go back to <laughs> what clear you said. Clear answer to a non clear early. subject. Yes, very good. <laughs> You quoted a, an NYPD intelligence officer questioning a, an individual about making, quote, anti-government statements. Right. I was so stunned by that. It's the Alien and Sedition Acts. You can't, you can't say anything about the government. And in fact, there's an argument out there that we shouldn't show disrespect to the president by protesting. It's, it's mind-blowing. Excuse me. Well, historically, it's always been there from, you know, the Alien Sedition Act since 1790 until now. It's also interesting that it rears its ugly head in a time of war uh, or about the time we're at war. Now, this is a very peculiar war. It's not a traditional war, but we are at war. And when that happens, the government historically tries uh, to we, control. Could you, you're a lawyer, so tell me this. You're a professor. Are we officially at war? We We're, have no declaration well, of look, war, right? right? But that stopped after World War II. Right. Uh, you know, Vietnam, Korea. Cambodia. Never. I mean, I was involved in challenging the bombing, mm -hmm. the secret bombing of Cambodia. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Found Justice Douglas in the mountain, and he said <laughs> no, and then the court, Berger, and everyone reversed Douglas. But there's a historical document saying it was unconstitutional. So we don't follow the Constitution on that point. Uh, I do think we are at war. Uh, there's no nation state. Uh, Al Qaeda is not a nation state. But the reality of 21st century America is that we are at war. and sometimes our folk very often minimize that issue but even granting the strength of that argument the government still when it comes to freedoms uh, I think is not doing what it should do and that is we can have freedom and security we don't have to choose one or the other the Declaration of Independence says life and liberty the preamble to the Constitution talks about to provide for the common defense mm -hmm. and secure the blessings of liberty. Mm -hmm. So it's not an either or. We must have both. And the balance is the issue. And whenever the government is taking actions that infringe on civil liberties and civil rights, you have to raise that question. Is it an appropriate balance? And are we getting, if we're giving up some freedoms, are we getting the security? So this brings us back to our question of leadership, politics, and um, common sense. And you've got here, what is this? The Patriot Act. This is the USA Patriot Act, and to show your audience, it is a massive it's document. 342 pages. Right. And the, 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 to just tell the audience, when we talk about the USA Patriot Act, its real title is Uniting You and Strengthening S America, A, by providing the P, appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. Patriot, U.S. Patriot yeah. Act. Now, someone got paid from our taxpayers' money to, to make this up. Right. Well, and know. that acronym tells you 
really in a nutshell what's going on here the packaging right. the using of 9/11 the framing in right. order the to and frame the issue and people voting for it were there 99 98 to 98 1 in the senate something. right fine gold from One wisconsin person was, was the lone missing dissent. or something and and right. Kerry, edwards kennedy our two senators in new york they all voted for it and again when you talk about leadership where are the leaders and where are the critical voices uh, from my perspective where in New York are the Damon Runyon characters anymore? I mean, uh, I like characters. <laughs> and if you're a character, you're usually a rebel. And these days, I kind of paraphrase the song, where have all the loud mouths gone? Uh, where have all the big mouths gone? You're making gone? me feel very guilty because I live with one and I'm always telling him to keep quiet. No, Jimmy, <laughs> now I have to call Jimmy, no, no, keep no, talking. No, don't encourage him. <laughs> he doesn't need encouragement. Because without that, you begin to accommodate too much. Exactly. I always wondered historically how in America we were able to confine 120,000 Japanese Americans in the 40s. How did we go through the McCarthy period? The McCarthy period. I is, never I understood remember, it. I mean, but, I'm older than you guys. I remember that so well. People killed themselves over the McCarthy period, and people were killed. I mean, their careers were ruined, their lives were ruined. How did we ever accept that? Well, we. I now understand crazy. it better. And maybe it took some time, but it's when people of goodwill begin to rationalize and minimize what the government does in our name. And the point that I make to people is that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, historians, professors, uh, our children, mm -hmm. our grandchildren yeah. are going to say to us, were what you were around you in yeah. the early 21st century? What did you do That's when they said you couldn't march, when you couldn't go into the park? Right. What Why did you do? You right. Why didn't you fight back? Why yeah, Dante, Dante has words for those people who, in times of moral crisis, stand aside. There's a warm place in hell for them. Let's talk about the Patriot Act. We hear a lot about it, and you've got the document in front of you. What's the problem with the well, legislation? Let's say it was Go past ahead. six weeks after 9 11. October 26th, the Now, that's the underlying, it. I think, right. cause for it. Forget it. Well, I mean, obviously, that's the cause, and many, many and legislators were, didn't even read the bill. Right. And people that, were afraid to say anything because like the they didn't know what was going to happen. Budget, they don't read. Right. right. I think that that's true. And what it well, did, they did complain the, that they didn't have enough time to read it, didn't well, they? Right. But, but then why did they vote for it? For it? Right. They should have said, "We're they not were voting for it. Not to Let's vote for it. take." Well, that's right because the political climate. Right. But that's what you need: political leadership. leadership. You need right. some strength and passion. We right. didn't mention passion. You need passion. There's no doubt about it. Well, we didn't mention it because there's so much passion around this table. <laughs> anyway, I think the overriding part about the USA Patriot Act, it gives the government, the government uh, vast additional powers to spy on its own citizens. Uh, it also takes away public accountability. It makes it more difficult to challenge certain actions by the government, especially the Attorney General, the FBI. Uh, suffice it, let's go through a couple of key sections, mm -hmm. 802. Uh, it broadly expands the definition of terrorism, including domestic terrorism. So the definition now is if you try to influence government through intimidation or coercion, something that at least two of you around this table probably have done in your lifetimes, <laughs> you're subject once. to uh, a potential uh, prosecution and for intimidation could be physically standing in front of a building and being totally nonviolent, depending it, on one's perspective. Right, the traditional sit-in from the 60s, sit in in the college president's office, uh, that kind of thing in the context of a government. If you went to City Hall and you sat in in front of the mayor's office, uh, traditional civil disobedience could be subject to this. Mm. The concern about the broadening of the definition and subjecting people to prosecution is the possibility of the criminalization of dissent. And this language on its face as applied to ideological viewpoint creates that fear. Second, uh, section uh, 215. Uh, which is which, one of the more notorious mm -hmm. sections. Right. It's the, the, the librarians, to their credit. Yes, they this really My wife is the president it. of a library board, and no. she's right? totally insane. Yeah. Thank them. If it wasn't for the public libraries, so, I couldn't even be here today right. to talk <laughs> the way I talk. Uh, so in the context of 215, what it allows is the FBI to go into the court and to ask for tangible things, which means books, records. And in that context, there's also a gag provision so that if they come into the public library and they want to find out what Ronnie Eldridge 
uh, you know, out. took out. Uh, wow. Then uh, the librarians can't tell Ronnie Eldridge or anyone else because that's a crime in and of itself. Now, I've always worried about this provision because I still have this fear that in Borough Park in Brooklyn, I you was in sixth book. grade, I have a book. You have I a owe book. $4 you million. Have more, you have more I than $4 one. $4 million dollars I owe, and if they ever find me, <laughs> so I looked through, I can't find the you, book anymore. You probably have college books out. So, so. does this mean um, if I belong to the Barnes & Noble Discount Club and I have a card that is registered, <laughs> I think every time I make a purchase to get a 10% discount, right. could they, they could. get yes. the records from them too? Right. Yeah, and, 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 and the red standard, book is on your list. The standard, <laughs> the standard is Actually, very uh, <laughs> low in the sense if it's, all they have to do is say it's connected to an investigation about terrorism. And so the premise here is troublesome too because the premise is depending on what you read would then say whether or not you're a uh, Potential well, that's like terrorist the McCarthy supporter. era. You'd go through the garbage and see what was being thrown out, right? Well, there's even a, a, a provision, magazine. 411, that prohibits people from coming to America to speak at universities, uh, uh, writers, political people, uh, if in fact uh, they support or have made statements supportive of groups uh, that are on the Attorney General or Department of State's uh, terrorist list. That harkens back to the McCarthy right, period. Right. There was a McCarran-Walter Act mm -hmm. in 1952 that prevented people from coming to America to speak. That got repealed in 1990. It took almost 40 years before we repealed it. So we're going back, and the aspects of the Cold War, the fight against communism, if you take the word communism out and put terrorism in, there's some similarities. Uh, and finally, 213 is the sneak and peek. Uh, they, while we're all today here, all three of us could be subject to this, uh, knowing our personalities, uh, and if not, if they listen, listen to this show, right. for sure, but they they're should. Well, well, we're all here, at the end. we're all here, and uh, they went yesterday knowing we were going to come, meaning the FBI, and possibly the New York Police Department with them, uh, and they went and they got permission uh, to go and uh, search our homes, sneak and peek, and the Patriot Act allows them to not tell us for sometimes as much as three months or they can extend it even more. And that is very troublesome because one of the reasons why we have this accountability, this check on the executive branch of government is that if they're abusing our constitutional rights, you can go where? You can go to the court mm -hmm. to challenge, but if you don't know. But if you don't know <laughs> so those are some of the aspects of the Patriot Act. And they can access your computer records. Right. right. I always tell people, you know, uh, you, on the email, you go into websites. That's all good and well, but be very careful. And, you know, uh, what you put on the email now, uh, it might be good for confession, but it might not be good for mm -hmm. the case. So in the context of that, you have to be careful when you're pouring out your inner thoughts about George Bush or the government or Dick Cheney or Rumsfeld or John Kerry or Edwards, you have to be careful that this could become a record of what they think your mm -hmm. viewpoint is. And again, what I'm always troubled is that just because you think something doesn't mean you act on it. What we learned during the Cold War and the attack uh, with regard to people's rights in the communist period was that just because someone said, uh, for example, I believe in overthrowing of the government, didn't mean that they actually engaged in any conduct mm -hmm. to do that. There are many people who talk a good game, and so the courts eventually struck down a lot of those provisions, and I think that what our hope is, is that the courts, once again, the judiciary, will eventually check the executive and the legislative branch, and we've seen a little of that with the issue of enemy combatants, mm -hmm. with Guant Guantanamo Bay, with regard to uh, process issues there, we will see in the next decade more and more challenges in the federal court, and the hope is that the federal court will be our safety valve to make sure that our rights are protected. Yeah, except the, as we discussed in the earlier segment, the federal court and the decision in, of Central Park did not do that. Let's go to Section 215. The ACLU filed a case on August 19th challenging Section 215, but in one of a classic... Which was what? Which is the, the sneak and... Uh, no, there's 215 would be where they get tangible things. Right, and they so have access to your library reference. and your medical. 
And yeah, don't, this one pains me. Go ahead. Okay, there's a catch-22. The ACLU can't discuss the lawsuit because the Patriot Act forbids it. Now, my question to you is, why didn't the ACLU, uh, ACLU just directly challenge it and release the information and let the government then take them to court? Why? You talked about leadership before. Why not there? We have a general rule that I don't like to publicly criticize my former colleagues at the ACLU. Uh -oh. I'm getting you in trouble. Ha no, I'm always in trouble. Oh, that's I, good. Trouble is my middle name. And, but in the and context of that, <laughs> yes. right, I don't mind that. I, I was very disappointed in my colleagues when, in fact, I heard how they handled that issue. Uh, you never know how you would do something, but I would like to think that if I was there and that came up, it would have been handled differently. Meaning? Specifically? I, I would speak. I would speak. I would not let the government shut me down on something that I thought was unconstitutional. I don't quite understand this, what you've just said. They, fi say they filed a lawsuit. Well, why don't you explain? Well, I, I, uh, he doesn't want to okay. do it. They fi the ACLU filed a lawsuit challenging that section. But the ACLU is prohibited by the act from discussing the I lawsuit see. publicly. I see. And my question is, just say it and let the government uh, go after you. Well, you know, uh, people should understand as great as an organization as the ACLU is, they're not perfect either. And uh, during the 50s, they were terrible on some of these issues. And I'm hoping that they'll be better today. I think they are. Uh, but you've given an example where uh, they were not eternally vigilant, which is part of our uh, motto in the Civil Liberties Union. And again, uh, I love them. I think they're doing great work. But on this case, they did not do what I think is the right thing to do. One of the ironies of this ACLU involvement here is that Newt Gingrich is an outspoken opponent of this Patriot Act. So you've got one of these strange bedfellow phenomena. Here. Well, what's been interesting the is the libertarian. Right, yeah, libertarian. The libertarians have been, from my perspective, the Cato Institute, even Bill Sapphire uh, on yeah. some of these issues. In, in the summer of 2002, Ashcroft wanted to create the terrorist and information prevention system known as TIPS, where they were going to encourage in 10 cities across America, 10,000 citizens to, to spy on, on each other. Oh, as, no. as we know in Brooklyn, oh. to rat someone rat, out. Rat somebody out of and, and again, that's antithetical to what America is supposed to be out. It conjures up all these images of Nazi oh. Germany or China, or as we used to call it, Red China and all that kind of stuff. And yet that was happening in New York. But there was outspokenness. Sapphire libertarians spoke out. In some instances, the libertarians were better on the these issues than the liberals. Uh, so I think there is a golden opportunity mm. uh, across ideological lines to create the coalition to secure people's constitutional and civil liberties. Uh, but uh, it's happened in certain instances, but it should happen more, in my mm -hmm. opinion. And it goes again to the question of leadership. Uh, it's not just leadership. As Dr. King used to tell us, he used to think that the leaders were outside of government, uh, the gadflies, mm -hmm. the rebels. Uh, so leadership is needed both in government as well as outside the government. Absolutely. Where is it in government? Look at the national level. I know, it's a painful uh, question. No, when, when, when Ronnie was there, you remember how I used to tell you how eloquent and <laughs> Elegant, uh -oh. you were no. Oh, no, no, no. When agree. she would speak, she would get up there, and wasn't quite Dr. King, but <laughs> I love was <laughs> close in the sense that every sentence count, every word meant something, and you didn't have repetitiveness, and you didn't have uh 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 uh. It was clear, it was coherent, it was passionate. Uh, today, I let me see if I can say this. Yeah, today I don't have any heroes in government. Mm -hmm. uh, we have. Uh, people who, they disappear when you need them. Uh, take New York City, 2003, on February 15th. People should have been outraged. Uh, doesn't happen. Every February 15th, there should be the progressive wing of elected officials doing something to commemorate this horrible event, and also politically, to stick it to, to the mayor. Uh, where, where are, are they now? Where Is are they now? We're on Central Park. Who's speaking? Where's the controller? Where's the public advocate? Where's the head of the city council? Where are our two United States senators? I can go down the list. They're nowhere. And the problem becomes is that when you have the silence, it creates a vacuum of leadership. And then and the citizenry right. begins to say, 
Right. I'm cynical. I'm buying out. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, or maybe I'm wrong. If there's no leadership, if there's no leadership they must to really right. validate, right. Well, That's I always thought the other part key, in the Giuliani administration, they used to float ideas and concepts. And when I was the head of the Civil Liberties Union, even if I didn't know all the facts, I had to immediately speak right. out on certain things. Intuitively, I knew they were trampling on our rights and you had to speak out. Absolutely. And then what would happen <laughs> is they too. would, I, they would back away. Question. Right. But exactly. if you didn't criticize, then, they move then they'd move forward. Absolutely. So, that dynamic has to be understood, and uh, I'm hoping that the younger generation gets more involved uh, and that we do have uh, the outsiders, as I like to call us, uh, being more vocal, more visible, and more critical. Yeah, you may call yourself an outsider, but you're a New Yorker. That was a typical New Yorker's <laughs> attitude, and that was Rudy Giuliani, is you hit me and I hit you back as fast and harder, and you keep doing it. And that's what seems to be lacking. I mean, certainly in, in the Democratic presidential candidate, Gary, talking about combat, he doesn't punch back. He doesn't understand the basic Brooklyn rule as you just defined it, immediately hitting back. They don't get it. What's what? Why? Well, you know, I think I, I don't know the answer why. And, and I think that uh, it, it I think in America today, the country is really split down the middle. Uh, and, you know, I think people underestimate George Bush. I think all this kind of good old boy stuff is contrived. Uh, and it sets up a dynamic so when you have the debate, you expect him not to complete a sentence. And when he completes the sentence, you say, better. wow, he's done you well. Know, it's also symptomatic of, of our friends or the people in the news business of relating. And I think that the Army, the, the uh, war history with uh, Kerry uh, had that that became such an important um, issue when it was played in very few markets and not even that big a television buy is because of talk radio and the use of cable television and and the um, who's controlling that and that is a very right-wing uh, group of people and it's a very also insidious I mean we are surrounded by all of these really little things that are sneaking into all parts of our lives and we're not seemingly realizing it well, I think we uh, have some troubled days ahead. I think it probably will get worse before it gets better. Uh, worse in what sense? I had to laugh I, when you were talking about the, the, during um, the Cold War and the worry of communists taking over the government. I mean, we can't even get Democrats to win an election, no less have the communists, the poor communists, take over this country. We had to be out of our minds to think that that was a real Well, what I mean by worse is that I think that some of the fundamental rights, such as the right to free speech, the right to protest, uh, the right to write what you want to write, uh, those traditional First Amendment rights that have long-standing tradition in America and in New York uh, will d be diminished uh, in the near future, uh, A, because of the 9-11 war on terrorism issue, but also because the climate of the political people who, in fact, uh, don't speak out. When I ran for public advocate, uh, and even now when I go around speaking, uh, there are people who say to me, tone it down. You shouldn't be saying that anymore. If you want to talk about race, uh, people say to me, you're a white boy. You're not supposed to talk about race. Race is not your issue. Uh, well, everything in the city has racial overtones. Mm -hmm. You must talk about it. So what happens is if the political handlers and the advisors tell the candidates that they shouldn't be taking on controversial issues. The reason why probably the elected officials that I'm talking about Central Park is because their staffers and advisors are saying don't get involved in it. It'll be over in a week. You don't want to get burnt by certain constituencies. Right. The conservancy might make a, a, a contribution, contribution to you. Can't Keep it low. Members. Go out of town. Go out of town. I called to a state, a state senator and an assemblyman yesterday to try to get a meeting for a All client right. group that I represent. They're gone until after Labor Day, I was told by their staff people. I mean, the elected officials like should that. be out there on the streets. They should be visible. They should, at a minimum, be observing what goes on as well as provide the leadership. And then they're all planning to run right. for something else, so they're worried about getting elected, so they need the money and they don't want to antagonize right. anybody. Right, so you do that over a period of time, um, and people catch up on that game, and they become <sighs> cynical and alienated. That's why only 50% of the people vote in this country. And when I say I think it's going to get worse rather than better, those are the kind of things that mm -hmm. I'm saying. But I am optimistic. I am Pollyanna in some ways. And I think that eventually all of this brings together new leadership, new ideas, 
and we'll be okay in the long run. You know, this brings up so many questions. I mean, you're, you're a, a, a professor, so I guess you have a great sense and appreciation of history, but I'm old. I mean, I'm not old, but I'm oh. 73 years old. But I have... As they say, mazel tov. Mazel tov. <laughs> but I have the experience and, and also the firsthand knowledge of a lot of these events that you're talking about. And you talk about the staffs advising these candidates not to do something. You know how Did old these ad- staffs are? They're 22. I mean, they're 22, <laughs> 23 years old. They have no sense. So each generation, it gets more diluted, and that's a terrible problem. So now I'm into the question of ageism. <laughs> well, I mean, mm-hmm. e- all of this is so relevant yeah, but you to see, this. If, if we talk we, about this and we put it on the table, I am convinced that there are people who then will rebel against these premises and do it differently. And the question then becomes, do they succeed mm-hmm. or not? And if they succeed, that becomes the model. And hopefully that will occur yeah. because otherwise we will uh, lose uh, the spirit, the preciousness of America as a constitutional democracy. And- but one, one of the striking things, and I, again, not to sound like a professor, is the role of ju- the judiciary in potentially checking the excesses of both the executive and the legislative branches. I think the courts have generally worked well. We may disagree with specific decisions, but they really have worked their, their will as sort of the, the founders uh, defined it and, and Justice Marshall. In the Southern Civil Rights Movement, it wasn't for the federal courts. Right. Interesting enough, a lot of Eisenhower, mm-hmm. Attorney General Brownell appointments in the Deep South, uh, the history of the Civil Rights Movement would have been different. Dr. King marched from Selma to Montgomery because a Republican, Frank Johnson, sat in Montgomery mm. and they knew that when Wallace said no to but their there permit, was a difference they can between go to court. Republican Eisenhower and Republican Bush. And so that's another no danger that. that's oh, facing us because of these But I'm just trying to right. point out that it doesn't have to be Democrats or Republicans. There's some right. bad Democrats right. and good Republicans sure. and people right. have sure. to they recognize have, that it's character issues. Get, right. uh, and, and I think that uh, in the context of uh, the issue that we're talking about now, I think it's important to talk about this and to make historical references so that people understand that sometimes history repeats itself. We learn from the past to go forward. Why haven't we mentioned Ted Kennedy when we talk about leadership? Or why we haven't we mentioned him that he got stopped at the airport because right. he was on a but, terror I mean, watch? So did I. So did, did I you? when yeah. I was going to Paris. Yeah. Right. The well, you Air are, France, well, you they, are a problem. There are a lot of well, but I'm not a problem. I'm not a problem. <laughs> they shouldn't be threatened by me. I'm the all-American boy. I still am. You believe and stopped. love this country. Uh, and I love the Constitution. But, yeah, they took me off, and then they came back 10 minutes later, and they said, oh, it's a different date of birth. And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, they put me back. I was able to go to Paris. If I was going to Pakistan, I'm sure they would have no, put well, me back on there. Let's just talk about it. But, <laughs> right. but well, why, why aren't we talking about Ted Kennedy? I mean, he does. Ha- he is a leader of sorts. Well, his time is But passed. he voted for the Patriot Act. But, he, but don't say his time has passed because he's the one with the history. Yeah, well, See, but I, mean, I don't write him off. I would hope that he would become more of the model for leadership. But for whatever reason, it hasn't happened. I don't think people see him. As, right. uh, he's never going to be able to be that way. Well, but he's, he does some valuable service and is good on certain issues. All right, guys, we have two minutes. Go. So, no, you tell me. What do you want to um, talk about now? What do I want to talk about? I want to talk about the next five years. And give me, give me a scenario. And give me an optimistic, optimistic. Give me an optimistic right. scenario, and give me, you know, Doctor Doom scenario. I mean, as we've said, we've been through this before with the alien, starting with the Alien Sedition Act, but also with McCarthy or in more recent times. I mean, I remember the Sergeant so, Finnegan. Were you around when Sergeant Finnegan was there? No. Women Strike for Peace. He was always at the at the rallies with his movie camera. He was taking all the pictures. Well, from the, the one NYPD. thing, the one thing that's radically different here is that. We, we had, had Al-Qaeda. We were attacked on our, mm-hmm. on right. our right. territory and, and in, it's our, clear in our country. That day really changed a lot of my thinking because uh, you couldn't uh, deny the fact that there were people out there who wanted to kill us mm-hmm. because of who we are, our principles, our values. And when that happens, and all of us I had as well, people that I knew who died on that day, I've been spending a lot of time being a lawyer for some of the 9-11 family members who are trying to get the tapes of mm-hmm. what happened in court. And uh, the last two and a half years, almost three years, uh, I think things did change. And I think it's different than ever before. And so I think our side has to recognize that and has to try to factor that in. At the same token, I don't think you give up our fundamental freedoms. And so. Uh, my hope is that through information and education and with necessary leadership, 
uh, there will be a coalition of people who will recognize that why this country is sui generis, why it's great, is because of those basic freedoms. And if we give them up, you have to remember you don't lose your rights with a big bang overnight. You lose them incrementally, mm -hmm. day by day, quietly sometimes. And if we lose that, then the terrorists have won anyway. And I think with that, it'll bring people together, and we won't let that happen. So we should all uh, meet in Central Park at 1030 every night during the With a candle, Republican. and at 1101, we all light up the candle. And uh, I think that the we, we, we should light it up at 1059, so it's already well lit right. when all the right. camera's rolling. Showing my Thank flexibility you. anywhere from 1059 <laughs> to 1101. Thank you very much, Thank Norman. You. Thank you, Doug. It was Thank a you. pleasure. And thank Always you very pleasure, much Ronnie. for watching.